you very much, uh, Damon. Excellent uh, speech and presentation, and I hope you can send us the text so we can distribute it around the globe. So, uh, next speaker, Amani Jamal. Thank you. Thank you so much, Raghwan. Um, that was a wonderful speech, David, so it's going to be a hard act to follow. I want to say thank you so much, uh, Raghwan, Dalia, and all of CSID for inviting me. It's a true honor and privilege to be here with you. Um, there are several of you in the audience that I haven't seen for, for many, many years, so it's really, really a good opportunity to see everyone again. Um, and I also want to say to NED, uh, it is my honor to be on the board, and thank you for that opportunity. Um, today's talk is really particularly special because if you sort of look at the genesis of CSID and you look at the genesis of the Arab Barometer, both of them emerge in this post-9-11 uh, uh, world where <coughs> the issue on the table is the key question of whether there is support for democracy in the, in the Middle East and in the Muslim world. And so CSAID took on more of the uh, you know, advocacy arm, if you may, and with my colleague, Mark Tesler, we, we began the Arab Barometer Project uh, to basically document, to document public opinion, uh, the mass public opinions of the, of the region, and to put it in front of all consumers, policy makers, practitioners, educators, about what Arabs really think. Um, and rather than people sort of assigning uh, attitudes and opinions, especially coming up with these erroneous conclusions about the lack of a democratic policy, the lack of a de uh, support for democracy, the lack of democracy on the Arab street. And we've all heard the different sort of uh, renditions of that. The, the, the data set that we uh, have compiled speaks to sort of capturing the true sentiments of individuals in the region. So for me, this is a, a wonderful opportunity to sort of bring both of those uh, threads together and talk about the Arab Barometer. So first of all, the Arab Barometer is a nonpartisan research network that provides insight into the social, political, and economic attitudes and values of ordinary citizens across the Arab world. Arab Barometer is the longest standing and largest repository of publicly available data on ordinary citizens' views in MENA. And our mission is to track attitudes and behavior, build institutional capacity in terms of conducting this type of research in the region, and disseminate knowledge about ordinary citizens living in the Middle, in the Middle East and North Africa. I'm not going to bore you with all the details, but important here to know is that we are now working on beginning the eighth wave of the Arab Barometer. We've been conducting these surveys since 2006. We have seven waves. We've interviewed over 125,000 individual interviews. We've conducted over 87 national representative samples, and we have seven waves across 16 countries. All of our data is publicly available for free on www.arabbarometer.org. We have an English website and an Arabic website, and we have a data portal for easy, uh, basic sort of like bivariate tool for uh, analysis, for data analysis. We have had generous, generous support from that. Um, that's before I joined the board, so there was no conflict of interest. Uh, uh, and, and we've been supported by many other entities, and I'm happy to discuss. Uh, we conduct national representative samples of approximately 2,400 citizens per country per interview. Everyone who participates is 18 and above. We only typically conduct face-to-face -face interviews, except for the pandemic, where we did phone interviews. Um, and we can talk a little bit more about um, our sampling and our design. Um, and more or less, just to jump into the, uh, our presentation, at, as you know, we've seen political openings uh, during the Arab Spring in Tunisia, Egypt, Yemen, Libya. We've had challenges to the state also in Bahrain and Syria. Um, and in terms of just taking account of where these things stand, you know that the democratic system in Tunisia reversed in 2021. Egypt, it was a democracy until 2013. Yemen, we still have an ongoing civil conflict. Libya, still ongoing civil conflict. Bahrain was a short lived protest. And Syria, we still sort of have an ongoing civil conflict. We all know that the key slogans associated with the Arab Spring were Quraysh, Hariya, Quram, and Saniya, bread, freedom, and human dignity. And now, as we look at some of the headlines from newspapers across the region, what we see is that during this period of sort of democratic consolidation, or what we thought would be a period of democratic consolidation, we also know that there was uh, a lot of corruption in the case of Iraq, there was a lot of economic crisis in the, ca in the case of Tunisia. To echo something David said, 
you know, stability, democracy and democratic transition is not necessarily the most stable of processes, but there is this commitment that where you're gonna end up is gonna be better than where you started. So when we think about now democracy in the Middle East and North Africa, what we sort of see is that there's a global decline of democracy everywhere, which is something also that David pointed to, and that this, of course, sort of has its spillover effects in the region. Um, and what we, what we are documenting or what we're tracking is that citizens in the region seem to have caught on, at least a good segment of the citizens in the region have caught on to this idea that there are weaknesses associated in democracy which may probably outweigh its benefits. And this is for citizens who are sort of living the everyday lives of a democratic sort of transition experience. And I just want to pause and say, like, you know, oftentimes we even as, an, an, uh, uh, you know, you know, scholars working on this area or conducting analysis, we often forget that democracy that doesn't really emerge overnight. When you think, somebody, somebody once told me, or I read one or the other, the, when you look at the, the, between the French Revolution and its first sort of successful parliamentary democracy, that lag was somewhat about 35 to 50 years. So for us to sort of look at one year experiences in, uh, in you know, with Egypt as democracy and call it a failure, or even 10 years of democratic experience in Tunisia and call it failure, I just want to make sure that we're not being premature in terms of how we sort of label these experiences. But what we do know is that Arab, Arab citizens know democracy is not perfect, and they know that they've suffered, quote unquote, during the democratic transition, but they still believe it's the best governing system. So I'm gonna sort of unpack that, these, these sort of kind of different threads about democratic, uh, economic weakness under democracies while simultaneously supporting the democratic outcomes. What does this mean from the perspective of ordinary citizens in the region? So A, how do many citizens feel about democracy? How have views of democracy changed, especially in the last 10 to 15 years? What accounts for these changes? And what can these changes tell us about democracy in MENA today? And what does it mean for the future of democracy in the Middle East and North Africa? So, all of you can see this, I hope. So, um, and I just wanna, I wanna bring, call your attention to the, uh, the right side of the screen. Uh, uh, basically, the question here is under a, a democratic system, the country's economic performance is weak. Do you agree or strongly agree? And what you see across time, from two, 2006 all the way up until the uh, wave seven, which brings us to 2022, you'll see that across almost every single country, and here we're looking at Lebanon, Tunisia, and Iraq. Um, Tunisia, we, we, we specifically monitor Tunisia because it was sort of what we always called our poster child democratic success story. And you'll see that the economic frustrations have only been increasing across time in the Middle East and North Africa. When we ask, democratic regimes are indecisive and full of problems, do you agree? Here we see a little bit more variation, but on average, the trend is also upward. And again, this is for the country Tunisia, Lebanon, Lebanon and Iraq. So again, there is, has been this idea of indecisiveness and instability. And when we ask, uh, and, and when we ask this question and we include other Arab countries, we see actually a little bit more stability in a place uh, in, the, in the monarchies, Jordan, Kuwait, Morocco. And then with Algeria, Libya, Palestine, and Sudan, you also see a little bit more stability. So it's really in the countries that sort of are under, who, that somewhat undergo regular electoral uh, you know, contests or at least in Tunisia, where we see that this idea of indecisiveness um, has, has taken hold in terms of a conviction. Again, this, this needed to be a negative thing, right? Because remember, the field of democratic contestation and political sort of mobilization in and of itself is a, uh, can be a messy experience. You know, you know we, and we all know that you know, the electoral cycles are not necessarily very smooth to begin with. So there are those some unchanging views of democracy. When we ask them the question of democratic systems may have problems, yet they are better than any other system, here is where we see more or less remarkable stability. Uh, we see some decline in, in, in Lebanon. Again, Lebanon has had its own other economic issues, but by and large, we have almost 70% plus in each of the countries, even the ones that are economically struggling, believing in democracy. 
when we ask, and, and similarly, you see this in the monarchies, and you see this in the, in the countries that have had a little bit more instability. So there is great support for democracy despite. And so why is this important? Why is this important for us to show? Because there are, we do believe there, there are these media campaigns and misinformation campaigns and disinformation campaigns that are basically targeting the region as well to convince the citizens that democracy is not a perfect system, that citizens would be better off without democracy. At least the evidence here shows us that there is still a very strong commitment towards democracy. Um, and then we asked the question of democracy is always preferable to any other kind of government, and the percent saying that, sorry, I, you know, as I get older, uh, and, and the percent saying that this opinion is closest to, to their opinion also is remarkably stable. So again, this is evidence that the citizens in the region do support this idea of democracy. We see that this is pretty much stable in, in Jordan and Morocco. Kuwait tends to drop in and out only for the reason that we can't ask all the questions in Kuwait. We can talk about that later. Um, and then similarly, the only country where we see the decline is Libya here. But remember, Libya is undergoing a very unique set of specifics or circumstances right so what accounts for the changing views, at least the views linked to the economic performance of uh, democracy? Here's where we think that there is, there is some influence in terms of how people are perceiving the suitability of democracy for economic growth. There is influence from autocracies like China, Russia, and Saudi Arabia in terms of thinking about countries that are doing quote unquote, or at least we're doing better economically and who have basically embraced this uh, idea of autocracy or what we call autocracy centered around the middle class and allowing for middle class growth and development. Um, the government performance in MENA democracies per se, we, we have to be critical of how MENA governments have performed in the democratic quote unquote countries and there's been a global retrenchment of democracy more generally. Okay, so the ascendance of China in the Middle East, um, and I'm not an alarmist, and I'm not one saying that China is on the brink of the Middle East, but what we do see is that China is becoming a little bit more salient in the Middle East, and for our purposes, what we're seeing is that people, especially if we compare 2018, 2019, to the opinions of 2021, 22, what you see is that among the people who believe under a democratic system, the government's economic performance is weak. We see that increasingly across time, they now, so for example, let's look at Iraq. Iraq, of the people who believe that under a democratic system, the country's economic performance is weak, only 52% of those, that group, wanted stronger relations with China in 2018, 2019. In 2021, 2022, about 77% wanted, yeah, 77% want closer ties to, 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 to China. So it seems that those who believe that democracy is weak on the economy, we're seeing this pivot, if you may, towards China. And that, that's problematic because if you look at the average GDP per capita in a country like China. In 2000, the average GDP per capita in China was $1,000 per household. By 2020, it had reached $12,000. So that's been like a 12-fold increase. So then it's, it, it, it sort of reinforces this idea that there can be great economic development and prosperity to families under autocracy. And to Damon's point, on the democracy side, we know that there is a very strong correlation between democratic growth and development and, you know, and economic performance. So the China model is a, a challenge to that correlation. Um, and if it's broadcast through what basically subtle messages and disinformation campaigns as a suitable model that can replace the messiness of democracy with economic prosperity, then this becomes a challenge. So, and we see that across the board, Across the board, almost every single country, there's a desire for stronger ties to China among people who believe that democracy, democracy's economic performance is weak. We also see that among people who believe that democratic regimes are indecisive and full of problems, there is, again, this other pivot towards China. Now, it's not as strong as the previous slide in terms of economic perform performance, but nevertheless, it gives us a, this idea that there is a conflict 
contending challenger on democracy in the region. Okay, um, so now we want to look at views of support for democracy and authoritarianism in the region. Um, and we are looking at this as a function of economic rating within each country. So in 2018, 2019, we asked people, um, what is the economic rating um, in what is the economic rating in, 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 in your country? Is it good or very good? And we sort of break down the countries as democracies and non-democracies in Maine. Being the democracies are the electoral countries. They're not full democracies. Freedom House, forgive us, you know, we know that, but we're we're looking at relative comparison. So economic rating in democracy, you'll see that the economic rating is quite low in quote unquote the countries that are dealing with elections versus the countries that have more or less maintained their sort of autocratic threat, uh, grip or have even reversed on, on, on democracy. So that's 2018, 2019. When we go to uh, creating jobs, but still 2018, 2019, creating jobs uh, in democracies, the percent saying that the government is doing a good job, also the quote unquote more autocratic countries are doing better than the more democratic countries. So this is something that we are also paying attention to. That, you know, oftentimes we think about democratic promotion. How do we advocate for democracy? Is democracy only an ideological campaign? Uh, the truth is, if the economic situation is being challenged consistently under experiment, experimentation with democracy, it sort of chips away at the societal support for it. Um, and again, again, this is a, you know, one, one thing that we sort of were always talking about over the last decade is that any sort of democratic program in Tunisia need, should have been or could, could, needs to be accompanied by a very aggressive economic development um, agenda as well. Democracy versus effective democracy. So solving the country's economic issue. Um, so here's, here's where we're getting at. More, more of these sort of personalistic regimes. As long as a government can solve our country's economic problems, it does not matter what kind of government we have. The percent saying they strongly agree or disagree. So you'll see that on this side, and this is from the most recent wave of wave seven, we have vast majorities of citizens. So remember, the citizens believe in democracy, but when you ask them about economic performance, you'll see that the vast majority of citizens say, if we can get a government to solve our economic problems, we really don't care what, what government we have. So Iraq now is close to 80%. And remember, like all the all our democratizers, Iraq, Tunisia, and then Lebanon, but the two top are Iraq and Tunisia. Close to 80% will say that this matters. And then when we break it down between folks who can who can cover their monthly expenses and those who cannot, we're not seeing much difference. So in other words, it's not just the poor people who are frustrated. Your middle class is frustrated, your affluent classes are frustrated as well. And I'm happy to come back and sort of talk about this in Q&A. And so this question is, as long as the government can maintain order and stability, in, it does not matter whether it is democratic or autocratic. Again, Libya, Iraq, uh, Mauritania, Lebanon, Jordan, you'll see majorities, majorities of all citizens who will say that, who will say they agree. And then we sort of break this down again by um, by age group. We also are, are, are concerned about, we want to make, see how, how, how the youth saw this question versus older generations. And again, we're not seeing the big difference. This is not really driven by an old generation that's more sort of populist or more sort of social contract oriented from the pan-Arab days. Um, the youth tend to sort of, uh, would like to see more stability as well. And this country needs a leader who can bend the rules if necessary to get things done. Um, just, uh, again, we see a lot of support for this statement as well. Um, uh, and then we also break it down by those with a secondary education, above secondary education, and below secondary education to see this is a function of education. And again, we're not seeing, so this is what's puzzling us in the Arab barometer. Typically things will separate on demographics, on income, on education, on age, but on these questions we're seeing sort of uni uniform support. Okay, uh, Tunisia, support for the new regime. So we asked about, this is the, the trust in the president. Um, this is sort of, uh, you know, the sort of uh, uh, catch-22 
coming to you, there is support for the new president, in, at least in our last survey. So about 55% say they have a lot of trust in the Qais Saeed uh, presidency and a lot of trust. So this puts us way above, yeah. This is 2021? Right. What date? This is late 2021. Late? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So this is a lot of trust. Now, what's going to be telling is what's going to come out of wave eight. We'll see if the, those levels of trust have, have fallen. Um, and then trust in the prime, prime minister, um, at least at the time, um, you'll see that, that was a, there was majority support there. So again, there seems to have been public support for the, for the, for the coup. Um, evaluation of President Tay Saeed's decision to suspend parliament, massive support. <coughs> So it's almost 90% support and evaluation of a uh, decision to suspend parliamentary members' immunity. Again, we saw that there was massive support. Um, and, and it seems that there's economic optimism with this new presidency, this new era, at least up until the late 2021. So at the eve of the Arab Spring, right, you have about 78% of Tunisians saying that the country in the next two or three years is going to perform economically much better. That falls with each sort of wave of the Arab barometer. By 2018, only a third thought that the economy would improve. Now we're back to 61%. So again, the economic story. Um, it, 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 it's not like Tunisians flipped on democracy overnight, or Tunis Tunisians became less democratic. But the economic woes persisted. Uh, and then the trust in government. So you saw like a decline in trust in government, and now you see uh, an uptake. Tunisia views of the economy's effects on the new government. Um, so trust in the new government, view the economy positively, view the economy neg negatively. So uh, the people who trust the government a lot, the story here is that they think that the economy will improve. And dem dem that one's on dem democratic systems may have problems, yet they are better than other systems. Here, if you fit, here we, we don't really think that it's linked to the economy. So it's, it's really this story here that the, the supporters of the regime, or who trust the regime, think that, that great things will happen economically. So making democracy work, how do people are defining democracy? Um, the truth is still, when we ask citizens in the Arab region about, about how they define democracy, most people will talk about this idea of, of dignity, and especially economic justice and economic dignity. Um, so we'll say, we'll ask, so when they, when they sort of characterize the primary characteristic of democracy, the, f the top response is jobs for everyone. You know, and this is a, you know, this is a problem, and, and it's not that they're advocating for a social system, and it's not that they're advocating for a communist system. What they're advocating for is that you have huge spikes in unemployment across the region, especially among the youth population, then jobs becomes important, and this is a number one priority for Tunisia. 55% of Tunisians say creating jobs. Again, you have our other electoral story, 51%. Lebanon is somewhere up there, also 42%. Primary characteristic of democracy saying government ensures um, law and order. You'll see in Egypt, that's a top priority. It's in Algeria, it's a top priority. Morocco, it's not the top priority for Lebanon, Iraq, and Tunisia. Jobs is the story in those countries. Primary characteristics of democracy, presenting free and fair multi-party elections. Yemen, Sudan, a quarter of the population supports that, and every other country, again, and not to, to disparage those. This, these are important characteristics of democracy, but I think they need to be tied in with like an economic vision. Um, and then saying freedoms of the press, uh, again, um, it does matter in a lot of countries, but the economic story seems to sort of uh, be dominant. The state of the economy, current situation in the economy, um, saying that it is uh, good or very good. You'll see that in Lebanon, Tunisia, um, Lebanon, Tunisia, basically the two lines on the bottom, that's where most of the struggles are coming. In the Lebanon had the port bombing and then uh, the financial collapse almost, the banking system, so that's where you see that. Tunisia has been struggling. Uh, we see more stability in places like Morocco on, on people's assessment. So when we talk about stability in Morocco, am I, okay, really quickly, let me just try to, this is, this is, I want to just take one minute, but one's very important, because we never used to talk really about food insecurity in the Middle East and North Africa, at least not what this data revealed. We ourselves in the Arab barometer were absolutely shocked 
when we saw this, the, we worried, when we asked this question in wave seven, we worried our food would run out before we got money to buy more. Mauritania, Sudan, we know those are uh, high poverty countries. Libya, civil war, Egypt, right? With all, the idea that Egypt has undergone economic prosperity under CC, 67% say we could not buy more food. Lebanon, Morocco, Iraq, Tunisia, the only country that did not report that was Palestine, and this is not to say, oh, the occupation is good or anything like that, but nevertheless, you understand what I'm saying, that, that this is a major finding throughout all the Arab regions, and the food that we bought did not last, and we did not have money to get more. Again, almost in about half the countries, majority of citizens are saying, about the majority of citizens are struggling with food security on a monthly basis. And this is when we want to link it to what's going on in Ukraine, Russia, the world economy, supply chains, the cost of food. So I can go on, corruption is not nothing new. Um, big takeaways, sorry. Major changes in concerns about potential problems related to democracy, but clear majority still think it's the best system of government. Um, recent changes likely the result of weakness of democratic experiments in MENA and rise of authoritarian alternative models around the world. Democracy is no longer un understood as a panacea. MENA citizens prefer democracy, but primarily want a system that will deliver results. And majority do not understand democracy in procedural terms, but rather substantive terms meaning economic and local outcomes go hand in hand, and we'll have a fresh, uh, fresh results, which will be released in 2024. So thank you very much.